All right, everybody. Hello. Welcome to Proceed with Passion Q&A sessions here live in the Facebook Copy Co-op community and across my YouTube channel. My guest today is Tony R. Sanders. I got to get that R in there. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's a content creator, host of uh, of the Stories We Tell Ourselves show, uh, Gallo Media, Facebook group. You know, what else, man? What else can you tell about yourself and to the people watching? I don't know, man. I'm hungry. I don't know if that's relevant, <laughs> but <laughs> but no, I'm super happy to 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 be here with you, Terry, to have this conversation. And uh, the the short story is I'm a storyteller. For the longer story, we we need more time. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> yeah, I got you. No worries. I do want to get into a little bit. Uh, go through kind of your LinkedIn experience. I like doing this. Okay. I did this on the last time just to talk about kind of your journey. Um, but yes, you talked about how you're a storyteller, and that's really why I brought you on. I wanted to you know, digest and consume a lot of the knowledge that you have in regards yeah. to telling stories that help educate and entertain. I love how you word that, you know, across your marketing, because yeah. I think when you're creating content, you can add value through education and entertainment. For sure. And I think it's necessary when people have multiple options of, you know, what they want to do um, as far as content consumption, right? So you got to give them right. a reason to keep coming back. And if the education is really, 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 really good, then maybe it doesn't need to be uh, like entertaining in a sense. And likewise, yeah. if the entertainment is really, really, really good, then maybe you don't have to learn it. But those are extremes. I think we do better <laughs> if we yeah. can mix the two and get a, 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 a good mix of the two. So uh, for me, I uh, I had an interesting journey, I guess, that led to storytelling. I've always loved storytelling. I just never yeah. really phrased it that way. And I think most people would would say that. But for me personally, you know, I grew up in a family of hardworking people and they always had uh, the same path. Right. Everyone would go get a job and they would work that job for, you know, 30 or 40 years and then retire. And when it yeah. came for like me to do that, that sounded really, really bad. Like it was sound like a <laughs> horrible thing. You want me to work at a place for 30 or 40 years that I don't enjoy, but they pay me and they're going to give me a pension or, you know, help contribute yeah. to my 401k. So I guess it's a good thing. Right. And right. I started on that path. I believe that story. Right. So I started on that path and, you know, 90 days into my 40 year career at a company that I hated, uh, they came in one day, like literally, and just said, hey, you, you, you've you been laid off along with everyone else at this plant. Yeah. Here's an envelope and it has three different options for you to, you know, take advantage of your severance package. And one was like a cash mm -hmm. out option. The other was like move to Lima, Ohio. And the other one was like move <laughs> to Detroit, Michigan. And I'm like, OK, well, I know what I'm going to do. And so. Yeah. Uh, I left there and went to another place to try to continue the same thing. And strangely enough, the same exact thing happened. I was uh, uh, working and they came and laid off, you know, a thousand people and just, you know, it had nothing to do with my work ethic or my attitude or my attendance. It was simply like the time you came through the door. And so, hey, you mm -hmm. haven't worked here as long as Dave. And so Dave gets to stay and you get to go, even though you're a better employee than Dave. And so I said, okay, you know what? I've I've listened to this story long enough. I've tried yeah. it your way. It doesn't work for me. I hate it actually. So I'm gonna just try it my way and see what happens, you know. And, and at least then when I get laid off, because getting laid off in my mind was a virtual certainty, <laughs> at least when I get laid off after 90 days or six months, I can say, Well, that was fun. And so uh, yeah. you know, I, I at least enjoy the time that I had there. So I started to do that. And strangely enough, I started to do work I love. I started to get paid more than I've ever gotten paid in my life. And yeah. to this day, knock on wood, I, I haven't been laid off since. <laughs> <laughs> I started, uh, you know, I, I realized by that time in my life that I really enjoyed uh, sales. I'd done sales, yeah. on, you know, for the majority of my life. I learned sales from my grandmother growing up. And uh, I learned that I also love teaching other people how to sell. And so I found yeah. a job that will let me do that. I started a, a entry level salesperson, which most sales jobs you have to. And, uh, you know, within 90 days made myself the number one salesperson in the company and got promoted to trainer. Uh, but in that 90 day sprint, that journey, I had a friend who I was talking to over lunch and she was the current trainer. And I was like, you know, been the company 30 days and I was kind of looking at it. I was like, you know what? I'm going to be the trainer here one day. 
And she was kind of offended by that because <laughs> there was only one training position that she was in it. So what are you saying? Yeah. Right. And uh, she kind of snapped back at me. She's like, you know what, Tony, just because you can sell doesn't mean you can teach other people how to sell. Those are two different skills. And I was like, huh? <laughs> so that gave me a little piece of like from a leadership perspective or yeah. you know, the higher ups in the company kind of maybe a story that they were telling themselves about me. And so I started to think, how could I change that story? And so I was reading yeah. a book uh, called Platform by Michael Hyatt. Okay. And he talked about how creating a blog, you know, help transform his business because he was able to get his content out in front of people. And I was yeah. like, man, if I started a blog about how I could be good as a sales trainer, displaying my skills as a sales trainer, maybe I can get people around here to pay attention and start to tell themselves a different story about me yeah. than, oh, he's just good at sales. And so I started this blog called uh, Coffee and Commission. And, okay, nice. you know, I put out like three or four blog posts and nobody read it. And then <laughs> one day I sent it to the buddy sitting next to me and he was like, oh, man, this is good. I, that, that, that last article you wrote helped me, you know, close my last sale. And I'm like, he's just saying that because he's my friend. And he likes me and, you know, he understands. But then he sent it to someone else and sent it to someone else. And yeah. I remember like I first got my first response to the blog from someone like I wasn't really cool with. And they emailed me back and was like, hey, in the third paragraph, you misspelled this word. And I just hmm. remember thinking, yes, he read to the third paragraph. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's a good way to look at it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't yeah. care about the typo or anything like that. And so to make a long story less long, that started to circulate <laughs> around. All the managers were reading my blog and asking me questions about it. And eventually it got to the vice president of sales and the uh, manager of sales training and they both came and sat down with me and was like, hey, whatever you're doing on the phones, if you yeah. could take that you know, and teach it to other people, and we know you can because we've seen your blog, we need you in a training position. And so I became the trainer and eventually ran the training department and did that until I left that company last yeah. year. So that's okay. kind of my journey and how I got into storytelling. There's there's some other things there, but that's the overall, the overall picture. I, I see. And so so you just left that company and now what are you focusing on now? Cause it looks like from LinkedIn, was this, do you mind saying the company? I know it's here on your LinkedIn page. I don't mind. Yeah. So I work for, I work for a company named defenders who was actually re recently acquired by uh, ADT. So, okay. uh, but yeah, we sold security systems. And so we had a, call center of sales agents that would answer incoming calls from the flyers that I'm sure all of you get in the mail because their marketing is amazing about, mm -hmm. you know, a security system for $27.99 a month. And it was uh, their job to take them through a process to uh, secure a payment and get a technician out and the technician yeah. had a sales process. And so by the time I left, I kind of worked with both sides of, you know, sales. We had inside sales and field sales. Okay. Yeah. And so you left that in September, it says, of last yep. year, of 2019. Yep. So obviously a couple months ahead of the pandemic. And then yep. now you're really focusing more as a small business owner yourself as well. So it's kind of like maybe you were preparing, like you're better prepared in a way for yeah. all this happening. Once I got into training and like started uh, when I was the manager of training, I realized that, you know, we needed more of what I did on my blog. Like we needed content, especially yeah. in a field based organization. I can't run around to all, you know, I think it was 136 locations, right? And try to train people individually. It's just not practical. It's not effective. It's not, you know, economic. And so we had to figure out ways that we can take uh, content and create content to put in front of people that were still engaging, still would tell the right story, still yeah. give them what they needed, but in a different way. And so I got really interested, uh, increasingly interested in content creation. So start creating videos and you yeah. know, creating e-learning courses and learning how to use all the tools to do those things. And so while doing that, some of the people that worked at Defenders or saw me, uh, you know, posting some of that stuff to my own uh, Instagram and Twitter and other yeah. social media started to reach out to me and said, Hey, I wonder if you can create an e-learning course for my company. Her, Hey, we need a video done for this thing that we're doing. Or, Hey, I need a voiceover for this thing I did. And so I started to, yeah. Yeah. you know, start to get some business outside of there. And I'm like, man, 
I wonder if I could turn this into a thing, right? And then in uh, around yeah. August or maybe July of last year, a friend of mine who I worked with at Defenders, she had left and went to this other company and I had kind of sent some fillers out to her and a couple other people saying, hey, I'm doing content and you know, if you need help with content to for communications or stories or even creative for marketing, like I'm here to do it. And she uh, got back with me and basically said, I have some work for you. And I'm like, great. Yeah. And we started to talk about it. I'm like, this sounds like a lot of work. And she was like, yeah, we want to do something on an ongoing basis. And I'm like, okay, great. So I'm like thinking in my head, I'm going to have this great client. And I yeah. had, you know, two or three other people who wanted to do a similar type of deal. I'm like, this is amazing. I'm going to, you know, double my income by leaving a job. And uh, once we talked more about it, she was like, yeah, you know, you it's it's basically a full time job offer. We're gonna, but you only need to be in the office three days a week and we're going to pay you full benefits. And we just need you to create content and maybe, you know, jump on camera, or do some live training, some live stuff like this. And I'm like, yeah, wait a minute. I can do that and still have my other clients. And like, this is great. Yeah. Like, this is a yeah. ideal situation. And so um, I left in September and I've been doing that and I haven't looked back since. It's been amazing. Yeah. Wow, man. That's an awesome story. Just of how it all it happened organically. Right. Yeah. And just consistently creating content and finding a way to, uh, in a way, monetize that, turn that into a business for yourself, which is yeah. awesome. Creating content a lot of creates people, opportunities is what I learned. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Where do you get, you know, inspired for all your ideas with content creation? Because I'm sure you've heard this, Tony, and people watching in the group and other freelancers I talk to kind of just like, well, I don't know what to talk about, you know? So like, how do I get all yeah. these ideas? And that just hinders them from even starting. That's such an interesting question, right? So here's the answer that I would normally give prior to uh, realizing it. And it's the answer you hear from everybody, right? And it's like, yeah. I get inspired by life. And it's like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? I, and I've given that answer on shows before and watched it back and like, I'm not really yeah. getting into the meat of it because I'm a, I'm a teacher at heart. So I want people to walk away with actionable things and like telling you I get inspired by life. It's not really that actionable. So here's here's my new and improved answer. I'm my new and improved answer. <laughs> yeah, my, my new and improved answer is that I only talk about things that I really enjoy or that I'm really living. Right. Okay. And so. Even uh, I do stand up comedy, even in my comedy, I only talk about things that I really care about or things that really happened in my life. So if you watch me do stand up, a lot of my content is about my childhood or my my family currently or something revolving around that. Right. I don't really stray too far outside of that. And okay. the reason why that works is every day starts to become an inspiration because you start to realize that everything is a story and every aspect of your life is an opportunity to create content. As I'm looking at my desk right now, I see like a Danny Granger bobblehead, which I know you're a Bulls fan. Go Pacers. And I see <laughs> an Iron Man coffee mug. And I see a picture of me doing a Home to Hope uh, build mission trip in Ensenada, Mexico. Every single thing has a story attached to it, which means I can create content from it. And yeah. so if you... If you um, you know, limit yourself is not the right word, but it is. But if you limit yourself to only talking about the things that you actually care about or that you live every day, you liberate yourself to be able to create freely. And yeah. that's the key to coming up with ideas or what I should talk about. Talk about whatever you actually care about, because it's going to flow much uh, more naturally and easier if you're living it every day and you never run out of ideas because you're always living. Yeah. And when you talk about those experience, you know, we, we touched on this earlier about education and entertainment, you can flip it around to educate and add value. So you can talk yep. about a story of how, you know, you struggled at your first job, but what was the lesson learned from it? And you can Absolutely. talk about that, you know, and that's value to other people. It gives them motivation or confidence to do it themselves. You know, it's like, I have a passion for storytelling and even i it's hard to say that I have a passion for copywriting because it's more to that. It's just more of like the, the passion for, you know, empowering others to communicate their message clearly. Right. You know what I mean? It's not the skill right. itself, but I can find <laughs> ways to, I can find ways to, you know, educate people, you know, through that with the different right. tips and stories that I've learned. Absolutely. And I think it's important too, for people to understand, like talking about something and educating someone on something doesn't mean that you're an expert on it. 
right? And so I always give the right. example of there was a lady who was a first time mom and she was so nervous about it. The only thing she could think to do was start to write out what she was experiencing and feeling. Fast forward yeah. a year later and every day she's writing a blog post about her new mom experience. And today she learned how to properly swaddle her baby. And then tomorrow she learned that her baby doesn't like these types of diapers. She has a, you know, a rash every time we use. So we she switched to this brand and all these different things. She started a mom's club <laughs> and she wasn't an expert mom, right? She's just talking about her experiences as a mom. And she never ran out of ideas because every day she's a mom. She ended yeah. up doing um, what we would, you know, today, something like a Patreon, but back then it didn't. But she ended up putting a lot of her content behind a paywall yeah. and creating a group. And she had 20,000, 30,000 people reading her blog, but a thousand of them decided to pay $5 a month for this extra experience. So now this mom's yeah, making $60,000 a year just telling her story. Like that's yeah. what it's about. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I'm reading the book Made to Stick by uh, Chip and Dan Heath. I don't know if you've heard of that. Of, I have. Of the book. Yeah, but it's, I've just started it and it's already giving me tons of ideas. And what was interesting is, you know, as educators ourselves, in a sense, it's like we're not trying to create new rules. We're just trying to help people create new ideas. So they mm -hmm. really recommend creating other structures or like with your case with the mom, with the Patreon, you know, she's maybe giving them some type of templates or some guides that she's experienced. You know, she's being vulnerable and telling real life experiences. She's not yeah. making up new rules, but she's just giving people, you know, some actionable insight that can, they can tailor themselves and create some new ideas to, you know, help themselves. I just found that, you know, it's something that's kind of in your head. Like you, it's, you can clearly understand it, <clears throat> but you mm -hmm. know, just applying it. It's just, it's so true though, just to create yeah. new ideas instead of new rules. And when you create content that's true and unique about your experiences, you get to do this cool thing called building a community. And sometimes, Absolutely. Um, as the song says, sometimes you just want to go where everybody knows your name. Like sometimes you yeah. want to be in an environment where everybody understands your struggle or your plight or your perspective, right? And so what she's doing with this mom's club, or I think about my friend, Denita Doe, what she does with Money and Mimosas, she gathers a community of like-minded individuals and creates a safe space for all of us to be able to express whatever we're dealing with at the time and have other people there who understand and can help you with their shared experiences of what they've gone through. And so it's not, you know, sign up for my mom's master class, right? That's a version of it. And that's okay yeah. if you're an expert, yeah. but right. you don't have to be an expert to tell your story and gather a community. Yeah, you, you can easily just be vulnerable. It's one of the biggest keys to a good story. And then, like, like you said, growing that community. Yeah. Um, what are some other things that make up really a good story? I know there's countless, but for you, you know, vulnerability yeah. for me is one of them, um, you know, but do you have a structure or anything that you kind of follow or just some other advice? Yeah. I do. Story structure is interesting, right? So, yeah. um, I think the research says there's only six different types of stories, right? And so that's interesting already. And story is story is story. If you write a story and it's funny, it's called a comedy. And if you write a story and people fall in love, it's a rope. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, story right. is story is story. Here's a good example of uh, of just story structure. So in 600 BC, this Chinese warrior, right after a war ended, he's walking, he stumbles upon the Great Wall of China. And so he sits down and he contemplates life. He contemplates the battle, all the people that he's killed, how he led his troops. He, he, he's trying to figure out if he made the right decision. In yeah. the end, he realizes that he was wrong. They fought the wrong battle. They killed people in vain. He falls off the Great Wall of China and cracks open to his death. That's the story of Humpty Dumpty, right? But the way you tell it, has this certain mystique yeah, to huh? it, but it, the structure is the same. And so like when you see every Ashton Kutcher movie and the structure is the same, that's because he's making the same genre of movie over and over, right? And I love Ashton. Yeah. So if by chance yeah. he watches this, it's not a slight, I'm just using it as an example. But what I'm right. saying is like, there's a structure to every story. And the most popular one, of course, is the hero's journey. That's the Humpty Dumpty story. But there right. are different structures. And so understanding story structure is really important because I always say story is the hidden language of humankind. 
everybody understands and connects with stories and different types of stories evoke different type of emotion. And so when you're talking about storytelling for marketing or for business, you have to think after interacting with this content piece, what do I want people to do, feel, think, or or act differently after interacting with this? Do I want them to laugh? Do I want them to learn? Do I want them to be emotional? Do I want them to cry? Do I want them to think deeply? Do I want them to be afraid? Like what do I want to invoke? And then once you understand that, you can start to craft the right kind of story for your audience or for your goal or what you're trying to achieve. But that structure is important, understanding your goal, what you're trying to get, and no story works without <laughs> vulnerability, right? You brought that up. Vulnerability is the key to any story. Yeah. If, you, if, you're, if you're not being vulnerable in your story, it doesn't work. Even the strongest people of our societies Their story becomes more interesting once we understand their vulnerabilities. You know, Iron Man isn't nearly as interesting until we understand his vulnerabilities, until we understand how his heart works, until we understand how self-absorbed he is. You know what I mean? It's relatable. It's like you see this rich guy, but then when everything's kind of stripped away from him and he's you know sitting there in the cave or just even talking about father issues, a lot of that stuff is relatable to a lot of people. Yeah, right. so it's someone not just, who it's like not a glamour story anymore. Someone who literally has the ability to save the world. Talk about yeah. having a savior complex. Like he can actually do it. So how, as a writer, do you take him and make him relatable to people to where people can see themselves in him? Right. It's yeah. vulnerability. And so the people on social media who are trying to tell their story to try to market themselves or whatever the case, and they only tell the good side or only give the highlight reel they're losing because no one wants to, no one believes that, right? It doesn't come up as authentic. No one can relate to the guy or the girl that's perfect all the time. And so you got to show your vulnerabilities. You got to show what your kryptonite is in order for people to really buy your story. Yeah, absolutely. And what what you just said there reminds me of even when Instagram started doing Instagram stories, they took Uh off, they took the pressure away from people of trying to get this perfect one post. Yep. Right. And now they, they obviously took what Snapchat did, but yep. they called it, but obviously they called it stories, but now you get behind the scenes. Look, you can tell some things in sequential order, yep. right? They take the pressure away and then they can be vulnerable. They can be real. It makes people more relatable. And that's just like why in brands who utilize it well, you know, you feel more connected to them when yeah. you see that behind the scenes stuff. Even back in the day with Snapchat, like one take snaps were a thing when like people would, you know, mess up and keep going and post it anyway. Yeah. I remember seeing like uh, Sean Duras, you know, do that on Snapchat and like made it cool to mess up and still post it. And that made me like him more because like, oh, it's not this perfect yeah, guy yeah. with the perfect cereal, you know what I mean? Like a perfect skateboarder, <laughs> yeah. perfect YouTube yeah. videos. Like he's, you know, he's a real guy, too. Yeah. Look at at the end of movies, end of comedies, when we see the bloopers, we love that stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Tony, I do want to switch gears a little bit here because sure. I did want to talk to you, obviously, about what's going on in the world, a lot of the social injustice, the Black Lives Matter movement, because you made a really impactful video in less than two and a half minutes, The Black Experience in America. I highly recommend you guys check this out on his YouTube channel. I think you got it pinned in your Twitter, too. Yeah, but- it is. But at the end of it, you know, you focused on turning something ugly into something beautiful, you know, with what you saw out there with the art and the boards being boarded up at different businesses. But what I want to ask you now is what have you seen, uh, you know, something beautiful throughout the content online and in person through all of this? Because it did start out really ugly, but, you know, from the content you've seen, what are some what are some things that you've been, you know, seeing that people are doing right? On a large scale, what I've seen is the taboo no longer being taboo. So, like, we're actually having conversations about some of the uh, sins, if you will, of this country. And that stuff is normally not talked about or not acknowledged or not addressed specifically by large corporations or in the media. It hasn't been at the forefront like it has in my lifetime and some of the older people I've talked to, not in their lifetime either, right? And there's only been these little spotlight moments where the issues are brought to light, but we never talked about them in this way. And so I love what uh, companies like 
Ben and Jerry's, the content that they're putting out to raise awareness, but also put their money where their mouth is. I love yeah. what, um, even though I don't like to give this guy credit for anything, I love what Michael Jordan is doing when he puts up a hundred million dollars to uh, aid with education and to fund, um, you know, the social injustices that are happening to black people in this country. And so there's a lot of good going on from a one to one level, just people being more willing to listen, more willing to have conversations, more willing to stand up, like feeling more empowered to stand up, uh, even if it doesn't affect them. That's the most powerful stand, right? Like if I yeah. go and stand up for something that has little to no shot impacting me, that's a powerful stand easier for you to stand up when it impacts you every day. And so some of the people who I would consider allies who are not directly impacted, but see another human suffering and they say, Hey, I'm going to stand up for that. That's beautiful. Right. Yeah. And so I've seen a lot of companies, a lot of people, a lot of brands do it the right way. What I'm more interested in is how do we sustain it? Right. Sustainability has to be uh, an important part of this entire you know, right. process that we're going through. And so when I see companies adding diversity councils to their uh, organization, or when I see them hiring um, a chief diversity officer, now we're right. talking about adding diversity to your organization and adding, you know, perspective that you wouldn't normally get if you don't have that diversity. And so that's what I love about what's going on yeah. right now. Yeah, you know, I'm glad you touched on that last part too, because I wanted to ask, how do we sustain this now? Because we are seeing a lot of companies step up. And I think that inclusion is so important because we are seeing some companies get roasted a little bit online for their lack of diversity. And yeah. so now they're addressing it. Yeah. And so I understand it's good to bring that attention now, but you know, if they're addressing it and now we're focusing on inclusion, I think that's key because like you said, you do get this new perspective now that's clearly been lacking within leadership of a company. Yeah from people of color and you can, and then you can help relate more to more people that way too. Yeah. You, and you see, unfortunately, like it takes a big misstep to bring something to light for people to realize like, yeah, Oh, this isn't right. You know, in my, in my own state, uh, we have uh, Carmel, Indiana and Hamilton County and yeah. the mayor of Carmel decided that he was going to sue the city of Minneapolis because he had to, pay more money for policing in his city to avoid the damnation and devastation that was going on around the country. So like, you know, it, it, it was ranked by money magazine as the number one uh, place you want to go for money. Right. So they, the, the, hmm. the idea, the story we tell ourselves about Carmel's they're all about money. If you go to their website, they talk, they pride themselves on their fiscal responsibilities. Right. But yeah. when you look at it, and you see that the mayor's cabinet, all the city officials, this and out of everyone, there's not one person of color included. And yeah. you see, you know, 3% of the county is black and 97% isn't. Then you kind of see like, I get how you guys made this mistake. You didn't, <laughs> yeah. you didn't talk to, you didn't consult the people who will be impacted most by your decision. And that's a good rule of thumb for any organization or anybody. You always consult the people that will be most impacted by your decision. And there are a lot of people, a lot of organizations that are, are intending to do the right thing, but they are not consulting the right people. And so then it comes right. off the wrong way. And so that's why diversity is important. Also, even with, you know, other movements that have happened. And I don't think, you know, like the Me Too movement, I don't know if yeah. two guys are the best, you know, people to talk about the Me Too movement. But I will say that, like, when you hear women aren't speaking up, well, if you if there aren't women well represented inside of an organization or inside of an industry like Hollywood, then why would I speak up? Because if the men get mad at me, they can take away all the opportunities and my livelihood is gone. As yeah. an African-American at a company that isn't diverse, I would feel the same way. I have felt the same way when there's no one who looks like me or comes from my experience or understands my experience on your leadership team. And something happens when I get called a racial slur at work or when yeah. you know something is happening. I don't feel comfortable speaking up because why would you believe me? Why would I believe that you'll believe me? And why would I believe 
that the rules would apply to me in a positive way when historically that hasn't been the case in this country. So diversity and representation is extremely important if you want people to come to work or you know perform and be at their best because they feel yeah. like they have an ally in the decision making seats. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, hopefully, you know, I, I remain hopeful that you know, this is the step in that right direction for a lot of companies. And hopefully it's not just some theme of the, you know, of the quarter <laughs> or right. they're just hiring, you know, token, token people of color right. too in leadership roles just to kind of shut people up. Like, yep. let's, let's continue to listen and learn for yeah. sure. For yeah. Sure. I agree. Well, Tony, I do want to wrap up here with a couple last questions. I always okay. love asking these in the proceed with passion uh, Q and A's is about the the best tools and resources you use every day to help run your business. Yeah. So uh, technical tools or just uh, yeah, yeah. General? More. Okay. I like yeah. I like the technical tools because of, you know I get introduced to some too, and just to see how you utilize what's out there. Okay, I'll do it on a couple of different levels because I think that yeah. uh, sometimes people get intimidated by the tools, right? So yeah. every single day I'm using the Adobe Suite. It's my okay. favorite line of products. I'm in Photoshop. I'm in Illustrator. I'm in Premiere. I'm in Audition a lot now, editing the audio from the podcast. So every single day I'm using those tools. But yeah. there are a lot of alternative to those tools that you can use on your phone that can yeah. produce similar results, not the same results, but similar enough yeah. to, you know, put out on most social media platforms. And so those are tools like InShot and Canvas yeah. and Capwing is another one. So when you see my videos and it has subtitles on the bottom, there's a great chance that I used Capwing yeah, to Cap auto generate cool. subtitles. Right. And so those are some of the tools that I use on an everyday basis. There's one other one that I'm forgetting. Uh, Canva, Canva Stories, Capwing, InShot, and uh, sometimes I use uh, Keynote if I'm doing a okay. carousel. I may even use an app called Magic Eraser, which helps okay. you quickly erase backgrounds out of pictures. And so okay. those are some of the tools that I may use to create some content. Yeah. Awesome, man. Love those. And yeah, the mobile apps are huge for people who are just like, how, really, you know, really they always cool. ask, how did you get those? How did you get the captions? How did you, yeah. you know, film that? A lot of times for me, yeah, it's like I use InShot. Yep. You know, for it. So yeah, awesome. Yeah. Or the road microphone app. A lot of time I'm out and I'm recording oh, stuff go. in the field and the road microphone app is really, really good to get quality audio out of your cell phone. Yeah. That's what I need to invest in for my, <laughs> both for my digital camera and for the iPhone as well. Just an extra mic. Yep. Yeah. Because that audio is important. For sure. All right, Tony. Well, let's wrap it up on this two part question that I always ask. Are you more burrito or pizza person? Pizza, one thousand percent. Okay, All not right. even there's close. Not, there's not a lot of people <laughs> in the burrito camp, but I ask this because I want to know, Tony, your three key ingredients to a success pizza. So think about it as success as a solopreneur, business owner, mm -hmm. just in life in general. What are those three keys? Uh, number one, your definition of success. I think a lot of people go wrong yeah. because they try to adopt someone else's definition of success. So that's number one. Number two, you have to have passion because passion is going to breed learning. Passion is going to bring work ethic. Passion is going to bring energy to fight through when it's tough. Right. And so yeah. and then the third thing is happiness. Ha let happiness be your guide when you are worried about if you're chasing the right thing or if you're making the right decision make the decision that maps toward your happiness not the biggest paycheck not the coolest fanciest lifestyle but make the make the decision that map towards your happiness at the end of the day that's all that's yeah, going to matter yeah oh man i love that i love that too it's so it's so true man just tr following you know the things that you love to do chasing happiness, the pursuit of happiness. Absolutely. I like, I've been phrasing, you know, something I do affirmations every day. And like, and then one of my daily goals is, you know, do your best to enjoy what you do. So even yeah. if it's like a project where I think it's cool, but the client may be a little bit of a hassle. It's like find things that I can enjoy to kind right. of get back to where I can find my levels of success and happiness. It's been pretty helpful for me. Yeah, and we could talk about a definition of happiness, <laughs> but for me, mine yeah. is as long as I'm utilizing my God-given gifts in service of others, I'm happy. 
Yeah. And so even if you, you said like, even if someone's difficult or whatever, if I feel like I'm using my gifts in service of others, I'm going to be happy with that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you hundred percent on that. Awesome. All right, Tony. Well, thank you, man. Three key ingredients for success pizza. I always like when I say that fast, it always sounds weird. Success <laughs> pizza, right? You know, but thank you so much, Tony, man. That's it for this proceed with passion live Q and a, uh, Tony, thanks, man. Before we let you go, please let everybody know where they can follow you and anything else to promote. I am at Tony R. Sanders everywhere you can find me. So make sure you follow, turn on your notifications. You never know when I may go live and do something like this. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Tony. Well, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. yeah. All right.